Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 296 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Is there anything more we can know about well-researched and reported events like the Boston Massacre? Are there new ways that we can look at these off-taught events that can really help us see new details about them, even when they occurred more than 250 years ago? Serena Zabin, a professor of history at Carleton College in Minnesota and the author of the award-winning book, the Boston Massacre Family History, joins us to discuss the Boston Massacre and how she found a new lens through which to view this famous event that does indeed reveal new details and insights about it. Now, during our conversation, Serena reveals why Americans are so interested in the Boston Massacre, which took place on March 5, 1770, how viewing the massacre through the lens of family reveals new details and context for the massacre and why it might have happened and details about Serena's work to turn her research about the Boston Massacre into a fun and educational video game. But first, did you know that Ben Franklin's World has an email newsletter? This newsletter sends every time a new episode publishes, and sometimes in between when I have something new and exciting to share with you. But most importantly, the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter sends the show notes for each new episode right to your inbox, which means you'll never have to remember to visit the website and look up all the links and people you just heard about. Signing up for the newsletter is fast and easy. You can click the link provided in most podcast apps, or you can visit benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. Okay, are you ready to reinvestigate the Boston Massacre? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Joining us is a professor of history and the chair of the history department at Carleton College in Minnesota. She's an expert on the history of early America and the American Revolution. She's written two books, including her most recent book, The Boston Massacre, A Family History, and she's created a video game about the Boston Massacre called Witness to the Revolution. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, Serena Zabin. Thank you for having me. So, Serena... We last spoke in episode 159, and since that time, Serena, you've published a book and created a video game about the Boston Massacre. What is it about the Boston Massacre that interests you so much? So I never thought the Boston Massacre was particularly interesting. It is one of those old chestnuts of the American Revolution that everyone sort of knows and nobody really thinks about. And I teach a class called Trials in Early America, in which we would always talk at the end of the course about the Boston Massacre. And at some point when I was teaching it, the librarian at Carleton told us that in special collections, there was an original pamphlet from 1770 called The Short Narrative of the Horde Massacre that I should bring my class down to take a look at. And when I did that, I probably did that actually for three or four years before I really read it and paid attention to what was happening in that pamphlet. And when I did, I realized that in the very first deposition that it recorded of Bostonians who were talking about what happened on the night of March 5th, 1770, a Bostonian said that there was this soldier's wife who had been talking to him and some of his friends a few days before the shooting. And this is not an obscure document or anything, but even after teaching it for years, I only then realized that this document was full of references to soldiers' wives. And it was really soldiers' wives that caught my attention. I realized I didn't know anything about these women. I actually don't think I really knew that soldiers had wives. And then I started to wonder, who were they? What were they doing in Bostonians' houses? And so then as I learned more about soldiers and their families, those were the stories that sort of started to spark my imagination about the Boston Massacre. 
isn't it really fascinating how we can read mainstream sources over and over and over again and then see something really new in them? And that we have these documents for events that happened all along the East Coast, and yet some of them make their way into archives all over the United States. So I find this movement of documents and this realization that soldiers had wives really interesting. It is amazing. So in the 1930s, there was a philanthropist who believed that it was unfair that only institutions on the East Coast had these original documents from the founding era, a man whose name was McGregor. And so he put together this program where he essentially bought as many of these as he could, and then he sold them at a sort of subsidized price to all of these small Midwestern colleges. So Grinnell has some and Oberlin has some. And this McGregor collection actually has a whole bunch of random 18th century materials, some of which American, some of which are British, and they're sitting in these Midwestern collections. Now, I really want for us to explore your video game, Witness to the Revolution, because we've yet to meet a historian who has developed a video game. But before we really explore that project, I think we should discuss the research behind the game and behind your book, The Boston Massacre of Family History. So here's a two-part question, Serena. Could you provide us with a brief overview of the Boston Massacre and why it's an event of such great interest to Americans? Absolutely. So the Boston Massacre itself is a term that refers to a shooting that happened in Boston on March 5th, 1770, when a sentry who is standing in front of the Customs House right in the heart of Boston, really kind of kitty corner from what is now the old state house, what was then known as the townhouse, he starts getting hassled by a bunch of Bostonians not totally clear what the hassling involves, but he gets anxious and he calls for backup. At that point, a handful of soldiers show up, led by the captain of the day. They line up in front of the customs house. The captain orders the crowd, which some people say was about 40 people and some people say it was 200 people. He orders the crowd to disperse and they don't. And at some point, someone yells fire. It's very unclear who, and soldiers fire. And when the smoke clears, there are five people dead or dying on the snow in front of the governmental seat of power. It's a pretty horrifying moment. It looks shocking, right? It's the way you would imagine it would be shocking to see people shot in front of the Capitol. Nonetheless, it doesn't look like a political event. It doesn't look really like this is going to be the beginning of the revolution by any means. But slowly over the next few months and then really over the next few years, the shooting comes to be taken over by the Sons of Liberty as an event that comes to be known as the Boston Massacre. And so by the time the first histories of the revolution are written, it's often seen as one of the important milestones on the way to revolution. Over the last few years, it seems like there's been a renewed interest in the Boston Massacre, given the number of works about it coming out. And then, of course, there was a lot of earlier interest in this event because we can see that in all the history books that had already been published about this event. What all of these studies have in common is that they really seem to be concerned with what happened and who's to blame for the shootings on Boston's King Street. Serena, your research is a bit different. You offer us a different account of the massacre. So would you tell us a bit more about your investigation into the massacre and why you think we need to view this, you know, famous event through the lens of family? So you're right. The question of who is to blame has pretty much been the central question of the Boston Massacre, essentially from the moment of the shooting until I wrote my book, if I could say that that really this starts as an important legal question, right? Like, should the soldiers be held accountable for this shooting? Or did somebody tell them to do it? That's an important question in the 18th century. The problem is, I thought, 250 years after the shooting, if we still don't know the answer, 
maybe we're not really asking the right question. I don't think it's a historian's job to be a lawyer. So I didn't want to relitigate the Boston Massacre. I wanted to know what it could tell us about 18th century Boston, about the relationship of the colonies to the empire, about whether there was going to be a revolution. And so what I really found much more interesting was not the question of who was to blame, but who was on the street and what were their relationships to each other? And when I started realizing how many people on the street that night, soldiers and civilians knew each other, were connected with each other, actually had both hostile and positive feelings about each other, I realized that this was a conflict not between strangers, but between neighbors. And once I understood that really this was a story of connection and not a story of disruption, then I understood that the revolution itself came out of connections, right? Came out of a desire for two sides, we might say, or certainly for colonies to separate, yes, but not because they already were separate, but because they were linked together. So what did your research reveal about connections when you looked at the Boston Massacre through the lens of family? What was Boston like in 1770 when you look at it through the eyes of women and children who were connected to the British Army? So Boston was a vibrant port town, but it wasn't in fabulous shape. It had some economic issues. It actually had lost a good number of its young men in the Seven Years' War. So it's a town that has more women than men, which is an important factor for thinking about what happens when a large number of men show up in Boston. But what my research showed was that Bostonians didn't start by thinking that soldiers themselves were some kind of embodiment of evil. They did think that the presence of an army was a bad sign. They were worried, as was true of almost all Britons in the 18th century, that if a king sent an army to start controlling its, you know, his own people, his own civilians, this is what's known as a standing army, looks like the beginning of abuse of power and abuse of authority. And so they worried about the presence of an army. But individual soldiers were seen as all kinds of just people, often not very nice people or not very well-educated people, but not seen as the embodiment of evil. You raise a really good point about a standing army. And we've probably been taking it for granted this entire conversation that in 1770, Boston was an occupied town. So, Serena, why did the king send an army to Boston? So troops come to Boston in 1768 after a series of protests about customs and the collection of taxes. And in that way, Boston is not unusual. After 1767, when Parliament passes what's known as the Townsend Acts, there are colonies all around North America and actually all parts of the British Empire that are unhappy about paying those duties on goods. And so there's plenty of protests and plenty of riots. Moreover, that standing army is used as a police force at moments throughout the British Empire, in Britain itself, in England, in Ireland, and other places too, primarily to crack down on smuggling and on riots, both of which are the problems that Boston itself is facing. So when the governor sees these riots against the customs officials and he gets anxious that maybe things are getting out of hand and he's pretty concerned that is no one's listening to him, that he's losing his own authority, he asks for troops sort of in a back channel way. He's sure and he's right that once the other political people in Boston start hearing that there are troops coming, that they're going to be really angry with him and that protests will continue. So he goes through these back channels, he asks for troops, and when they show up in 1768, 
there are Bostonians who are deeply offended. They're offended by the idea that their town is thought of as a place that is so out of control, so mobbish in the 18th century language, that they need troops to control them. And this insults them. They think of themselves as a kind of orderly good people, right? Not a mob. It's probably worth saying, however, that there are Bostonians who see the arrival of troops and don't think of them in those kinds of political terms at all. And especially these young women in Boston who look at the arrival of these troops and they see marriage material, which they don't have. It seems like these protests around the Townsend duties would have had to have been pretty loud and violent for the government to justify sending in a standing army. So could you tell us a bit more about the Townsend duties and how and why Bostonians reacted the way they did? So the Townsend duties are an attempt to collect more revenue for the British Empire on goods that primarily are going to be imported from England, paint, lead, glass, things like that. And they are protested not necessarily because people think that they are too high, but because they don't like the process by which those taxes were imposed. And they start to argue famously that, oh, colonies are willing to pay taxes that they set themselves on their own internal trade, but not on external trade or vice versa. And this distinction between internal and external trade is precisely the one that Ben Franklin tries to make, not that successfully. So yes, there are protests, partly because people don't want to pay the taxes, and partly because since they don't want to pay the taxes, people are trying to smuggle the goods in, right? So that they come in, you know, under the cover of night, so the customs officials don't collect on them. And in fact, the troops are brought all around Britain for cracking down on smuggling. I don't think that Boston is particularly riotous. I think actually the governor is particularly anxious. Now, how many troops are we talking about? How many troops did the Crown send to Boston? In the end, the Crown sends four regiments. So a regiment is about 500 men. So roughly 2,000 guys who are regular army. And then traveling with them, of course, are lots of other people, many of whom are women and children. And just so we can put this in perspective, how did these 2,000 soldiers and all of their family members fit within the city of Boston? So I guess what I'm asking is, what was the ratio between soldiers and civilians? So Boston is a town of about 16,000 people at this point, and it's about a square mile. It's a pretty small peninsula. It's before they've put all that landfill in the back bay. And how did Boston, which, as you mentioned, was this small town of about 16,000 people located in about one square mile. How did Bostonians make room for this additional influx of 2,000 soldiers and all of the women and children and people who accompanied the army? It's not easy for the army and for the town to figure out where these troops are going to go. And this is in part because the selectmen who kind of run what's going on in Boston are very clear that the troops should be staying out in Boston Harbor on what's called Castle Island, where there is a barracks that actually was renovated fairly recently. It was renovated for the Seven Years' War with Massachusetts tax dollars. And the whole point of that barracks was to house British troops. So the selectmen, when they heard that there were troops coming to Boston, said, well, we expect to see them living on Castle Island. And the governor, who's thinking, well, I want these troops here to support me and my authority as I'm trying to govern from the center of Boston. I don't want troops that are three miles away if you row and seven miles if you march. That seems really too far to put down any kind of riot. So he says, no, no, no. I want troops to be right in the heart of Boston. But the problem with the governor's position has to do with the Quartering Act, 
So the 18th Century Quartering Act, which is renewed almost every year by Parliament, actually is very clear about where troops can be placed. And the Quartering Act says very explicitly that if there are existing barracks in the town, troops have to be placed there first. If there are no existing barracks or the barracks don't work, then they need to be put in public houses. That's why they're called public houses, which, of course, we know as pubs or taverns and places where alcohol flows, which is one reason that commanding officers were always very reluctant to put troops in public houses. And only if there are no barracks and no public houses could troops be put into private homes. And they can't just be stuck there unless all of these other criteria are fulfilled. So the selectmen who know the law are very clear. No, you can't just put troops in private homes. You have to use the barracks. And they have a standoff for a while. And so for a while, some of the regiment are actually camping out in Faneuil Hall. And some of them have put up tents right in the middle of the Boston Common. And they're there until there's a sort of, you know, early snowfall it comes to be late October, early November. And this clearly is not tenable. And so the compromise that the selectmen and the army with the help of the governor come up with is instead of requisitioning private homes, they would rent private spaces. So they end up paying Bostonians for some empty warehouses that they turn into barracks, but also for all kinds of other empty spaces in Boston. So some people rent an extra house or two if they have those. Those tend to be for officers. But Bostonians end up renting out their spare rooms, their sheds, their basements, their attics. Whatever empty space they have, they rent it to the British Army for troops. I'm curious what these regiments must have done for the local Boston economy, because you mentioned at the start of our conversation that Boston was a place that was having some financial problems. And yet now you have these extra 2000 plus individuals living in the town. And you mentioned that the army is renting all of these different places. Plus, soldiers always need various goods, food, beer, those types of things. So it sounds like the arrival of these four regiments must have also brought an influx into the local Boston economy. It's true that, in fact, the army does pay for firewood, right, as well as rent. They're not happy about it. The British Army is very cheap. And so they spend a lot of time grumbling about all of the bills. But nonetheless, they do pay individuals. And they pay some of these people are sons of liberty. And previous historians have looked at this and sort of chortled at the idea that Sons of Liberty are kind of willing to compromise their values and take rent money or firewood money or money for meat from the British Army. But it really didn't look like that. It really looked as though the town had won that particular argument. They were really pleased to be getting any money out of the army. Now, I'd like to turn to something else you mentioned earlier, which is that a lot of women and children accompanied these regiments to Boston. Would you tell us more about the people who accompanied the soldiers? Yes. So it's not easy to figure out exactly how many there were. The British Army understood that it needed women to travel with the troops. They paid a certain number of women, roughly six women per company, to travel and to do a certain amount of work, especially laundry. Laundry was truly women's work. Men really refused to do it. Men would cook. They objected much less to cooking, but they wouldn't do laundry. So there was an expectation that at least six women per company would be paid for by the army. The army would pay their travel expenses and would pay them rations and some fraction of rations for their children. So that at a minimum we're talking about roughly 60 women. But in fact, we know that many hundreds of women came with the troops that were not necessarily official, but that in fact, commanding officers usually just kind of squeeze them on and let them come because men threatened to desert if their families couldn't come with them for the most part. So there are probably at least 450 
women and really untold number of children who show up in Boston when they come. So did these women and children live with their male relative in the army? And did the army also pay for quarters for these, you know, British army families? Yeah, they absolutely did. The spaces are not segregated. So even within the barracks, the sort of more communal housing that they put together as warehouses, there are women and children there too. There are also congregate housing where multiple families are living together in, like I said, in someone's shed or something else. But yes, they were not separated until after the shooting when some of the soldiers are sent off to those barracks on Castle Island and some of the women stay in Boston for a few months. Okay, so say you're the wife of a British soldier and you and maybe your two little kids accompany your husband to Boston and you find out when you arrive that you're to lodge in the house of another family. What could you expect in terms of your living situation? What would your experience living with this other family be like? So say you are, yes, an Irish woman who's come, you've been traveling around the empire, you've spent a couple of years already in Canada, and now you end up in Boston living, yes, in someone's extra space. You can expect that you're not necessarily going to be welcomed with open arms, especially in the beginning, right? You can expect that this can be a rough, set of relationships, and it will take you a little while maybe to find your people. But in fact, you could also expect that it's likely eventually you will find some Bostonians who will become friends, that they will become your neighbors, the people from whom you borrow things, quite likely people who will act as a godparent for your next child when that happens, whom you baptize in a Boston church. So, you know, you're not living in luxury, but really we need to remember that very, very few people in Boston have a lot of space anyway, right? So John Hancock has a huge house, but he's almost did. The density of Boston is about the same now as it was then, and it was much, much smaller. So there's a lot of people living squished together. But it does sound like if you were part of the army living among Bostonians, that you would have had the opportunity to become a part of the Boston community, that you weren't ostracized. So first, you would have had that opportunity that some people took and some people didn't. So we can see when some of these army families have children and they baptize them in the churches, some of them only ask other military people to be their godparents right? They really seem to keep their community pretty close. Those are their people. But there are, are others that we see clearly who do meet others, get to know them. Certainly, the army stops handing out rations within a couple of weeks. At some point, you have to do your own shopping, right? You have to get to know the shopkeepers. You have to get to know the butcher. You have to bargain for your firewood. All of those things become part of the way that you get to know a community. And if you're a Bostonian, how did you receive these army wives and families? Some people were happier than others. There absolutely are some conflicts. There are brawls, right, in the streets. And we know all of those things. They're quite well recorded, somewhat gleefully, by the Sons of Liberty, who sees these conflicts as evidence of the disreputable nature of the army. At the same time, even Sons of Liberty who are pretty well-off people, many of them who are, for example, part of societies like Freemasons, welcome into their own you know, chapters of those Freemasonries other officers from the British Army. So they find ways of interacting socially, some of them very warmly, some of them not so much. And I would say relationships between men, relationships between women, and relationships between men and women all run the gamut between hostility and affection. So when you look at all of the research you've done, do you think quartering these four regiments and their families in Boston had any effect on how Bostonians 
viewed the British Empire. Do you think the army humanized the empire for Bostonians at all? Yes. I humanize is perhaps not exactly the right word, but I do think that the presence of the army has an enormous impact on how Bostonians thought about their relationship to the empire. It made the empire real, all the parts of it, right? So both those kind of warm and happy relationships and also its power. There were people walking around with guns, right, who were literally the arms of the British Empire were part of their community. And so Bostonians understood in a very intimate, personal way in their own homes, sometimes in their own beds, what it meant to be connected to the British Empire in a way that in the 1750s, especially before the Seven Years' War, but even if you had stayed home during the Seven Years' War, you might not have paid very much attention to. Now, on March 5, 1770, there was a shooting on Boston's King Street that involved both civilians and British soldiers. Serena, what do you think happened on March 5, based on your reading of all the different historical sources that you've consulted? I think that on the night of March 5th, there were many people wandering around eight, nine o'clock in the evening, some people in taverns, some people walking right through the center of Boston, who knew each other, who stopped to chat, who asked how things were going at home in all of the normal, friendly ways. And I think that there were a bunch of teenagers who were a little bored, a little restless, and found the temptation of teasing somebody who stuck in a little box and unable to, you know, really respond in the way that he might have liked to, to really attempting target. And I say this as someone with three teenagers of my own, you know exactly what that feeling must have been like. So I think that there is both a sense of people feeling like this is a normal time and people feeling that there are some tensions, right? Some annoyances between soldiers and civilians that are in part the result of people living so crammed together in this tiny space that they're actually also getting a little tired of each other, not because they think that the politics of the moment have really shifted any in the 17 months that the soldiers have been there, but because 17 months is a long time to be sharing your town with a couple thousand people that you really don't want there. So for the most part, I would say this is a moment when people are crammed together, knowing each other, talking with each other, that Certainly when the sentry calls for backup and his backup comes, these other soldiers come, I do believe a lot of other Bostonians showed up also. There are other Bostonians around that night. I don't know if there was a pre-concerted plan for a number of brawls. I don't find that a completely helpful question because there are brawls other nights, not all of which add up to a shooting. This one does. And I think that the longer soldiers are in town, the more likely it is that the probability of a shooting is going to happen. And soldiers knew that. Officers knew that. Urban policing is never a happy job for an army. They don't want to do it. They understand that the likelihood of a shooting is high. So what happens that night is soldiers are on the street and tensions are high. It's dark. It's nine o'clock at night. There's no streetlights in Boston. So nobody can really see what's going on. There's hollering and there's some yelling. And like I said, someone yells fire. And I do not believe it was a deliberate command to fire, but I am not sure whether it was a taunt. You don't dare fire, which Bostonians were apparently yelling at the soldiers or whether actually somebody said to them, you should fire, see what happens. But somebody heard that word. It's pretty amazing to think about how there are several accounts of the events of March 5, 1770 on King Street and that 
there's so much inconsistency between these accounts of the Boston Massacre. So it seems to have been this event that many Bostonians witnessed, and yet none really knew what was happening. Yes, it's a fascinating problem of eyewitness testimony, right? That so many people can see the same event and yet take it away so differently. Some of that is maybe unsurprising. I think people have a different ability to count the number of people in a crowd, right? So estimating a crowd is not an easy thing to do. So perhaps it's unsurprising. But a lot of it is that people had very partial views. They were unable to see a lot of what was going on. It was dark. There were a lot of people, certainly, I think there were probably more than 40 people in really a fairly narrow street, not minuscule, not an alleyway, but you know, we're not talking about a boulevard either. And so people couldn't see very well. And some people saw what they expected to see. And so for some of that, that is deliberate violence on one side or the other. But a lot of it is filtered through what they imagined what had happened. So yes, I think the problem of eyewitness testimony is fascinating and deeply frustrating. Now, your book, The Boston Massacre, Family History, really looks at what family life can tell us about the Boston Massacre and about life in Boston during 1770. But Serena, your video game, Witness to the Revolution, really offers us a different vantage point. And just after we take a moment to hear from our episode sponsor, I really want us to dive into Witness to the Revolution and find out what this video game can show us about the Boston Massacre. You may have learned that the Emancipation Proclamation and Civil War Union victories ended slavery in the United States. But so much more went into abolishing slavery than battles and declarations. And freedom meant more to Black people than eventually being paid for their labor. Seizing Freedom is a new podcast from Virginia Public Media, or VPM, which focuses on the agency Black people exercised to define what freedom meant for themselves. In Seizing Freedom, you'll hear how Black Americans fought to liberate themselves during the Civil War and how they made freedom real by organizing for equality and justice during Reconstruction, despite every attempt to violently suppress their actions. You'll also hear how Black Americans went about accomplishing these feats in their own words. Seizing Freedom presents these stories through the lens of lived experience, drawing from letters, diary entries, autobiographies, and more to showcase voices from United States history that have long been ignored. You can find the Seizing Freedom podcast at seizingfreedom.com, and you can subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay, now when I think of Serena's video game Witness to the Revolution, I really think about all the discrepancies we have in these different testimonies about the Boston Massacre. Serena, was it these differences in these eyewitness accounts that inspired you to create the video game Witness to the Revolution, or was there some other inspiration? Yes, there are Bostonians who are saying a week or a month after the shooting that they think we will never come at the truth. And that was a really inspiring idea for me. I thought, okay, nobody has any confidence that we're going to know what happened. So let's turn that possible frustration into its own virtue and think about what does it mean to play a game that you don't completely know how it will end? And so that was the inspiration in some ways for thinking about Witness to the Revolution. Another piece that inspired this game or what may be one of the most important pieces that came out of this game had to do with imagining Boston as a place. I spent a lot of time thinking about what Boston was like, what its streets were like, who was living where, how close people were to a tavern or to a church. And as I plotted on a digital map, who was living where, I started to create a really dense playable idea, right, of lots of different pieces on a map. I had students working with me. And as we started to imagine who saw what as they walked around Boston that night and who passed whose house, lots of questions about who lived where, the students started to also think it would be fun to somehow turn this into a game. How could we gamify all of this data? So I started wondering what kind of game could we create 
with all of this data? What would be fun? So we started by thinking about a game where we would take all of these depositions, those depositions I started with, where people started talking about who's sitting in their house threatening violence against the troops or against Bostonians and turning them into parts of a game where you would collect depositions as you would in any kind of detective game to try to figure out what happened. But instead of actually playing a detective game that has an answer where you know who the murderer is, instead, this game leads you to have to sort through different kinds of evidence, who's telling you what piece of evidence, and from there, try to come up with your own interpretation about what happened. When we offered the alpha version of this game, which we did at a couple of conferences and to some students, and to a number of middle schoolers, including my own, we were informed that this game is not very fun. And that really the problem of sorting through eyewitness testimony to see who you believe turns out not to be a game that's very interesting for people who aren't historians. So we have recently really torn the game apart and are starting over and thinking really differently about how this game is going to work and how it's set up. And I can talk some about that if you'd like. Yeah, we would love to have you talk about this further because I think one of the things that we're thinking, or at least I'm thinking, is what are your goals for a game that offers inconsistent testimonies of the Boston Massacre? I mean, where is the fun in sifting through these accounts? Exactly. I think it's a really good question. It's very hard to think in game terms about what is fun about ambiguity. So the way the original version of the game worked, you would interview people and you would look at five or six factors, how many people each witness said was in the square that night, how angry they were, who they could see, who yelled fire all of those kinds of questions. And then you would sort out that testimony and you'd have a decision screen and you would decide what you think happened. And then you would see a recreation of the shooting based on your version. That actually has no tension to it. There's no game. And so we started looking at other kinds of computer games that have a heavy narrative to them that do open up questions of ambiguity. So one game that we looked at was a game that I think was popular a few years ago called Edith Finch, where you're walking through a home, you're trying to figure out how a whole bunch of different people die. It's not completely clear whether the assessment you come up with is correct or not. But in some ways, that matters less than the fact that you are collecting all of these stories. And we started thinking maybe collecting stories is in part a more interesting idea here, but really we needed more fun. So we've developed this actually around people. We've reconstructed it so that it's a little more episodic, right? And so here we end up with a story, a game that is going to be centered around one of, I think we're starting with five different people who gave testimony that night, who saw something but that in fact, you have to play some mini games to figure out what they saw. For example, one of the Boston men who's on the street that night who gives testimony is a cabinet maker named Thomas Wilkinson. One of the things that he tells us is that it's very hard for him to see what happened that night because he keeps walking around trying to get a better position. So we ended up actually creating a maze game for him right? So now what you're trying to do is work your way through this crowd and through a file of soldiers to get to a position where you can see something. So the game itself then becomes a mini maze, for example. So this is where I should probably state that I was lucky enough to see the earlier version of Witness to the Revolution and give it a play. And what I really thought of that version was that It was fun just because of the 3D recreation of Boston, like to actually see and move around Boston and what it must have looked like in 1770 is what I thought was fun about that game. But Serena, I guess, you know, my question now is what kind of historical research 
goes into a game like yours, that goes into creating that 3D version of Boston? Because we know from our many discussions on this podcast that historians seek information in archives, they then analyze and contextualize the sources that they consulted, and then they write up their interpretation of the people's places and events that they're writing about. Is this process the same or roughly the same for creating a historical video game? That's not quite the process of making a video game. Although to make a historical video game, the process you just described is the first step, right? So absolutely, it required all this research and the gathering of all this material and some sense of what happened, right? How do we put the stories together? But then from there, it really takes a whole set of other questions that are not unrelated to book writing, but are different. So that question of how do you tell a story, which is one of the questions that we ask as we write a book, becomes a question of how do you make a game? How do you have some tension, right? Not narrative tension here, but some kind of game tension so that you want to win, right? So you want to know something. So we ask similar kinds of questions like that. But we also spend a lot of time thinking about material culture so that the game looks somewhat appropriate. One of the mini games is of a barmaid who has to make flip. So she has to walk around and collect the ingredients and stick a hot poker in so it will foam up and then she has to be able to deliver that. So, you know, we do spend a fair amount of time thinking about recipes and what might go into this, what this would look like. So those pieces go in. But of course, we also have to think about things like game mechanics that are quite different. There's a fair amount of coding that goes into it. There's an immense amount of art that needs to go into it because a game is a deeply visual experience. And especially this game, which we want to be a 3D immersive experience. We really need it to look like a place that you want to be in. So just like a history book, it sounds like historical video games require a lot of collaboration. You know, when historians write books, they meet archivists who introduce them to new collections. So there's collaboration there. And then, of course, there's other historians that historians consult to see if they're on the right track and to see if their argument's strong. And it seems like you need this same kind of support base or a similar support base to create a video game. Yes. A historical video game is a deeply collaborative project, and I barely holding on to being a part of this project. I have a fabulous collaborator, Dr. Austin Mason, who is our digital humanist here at Carleton, and we've recently opened up our project to begin to collaborate with the University of Wisconsin Stout, where we have two fabulous scholars there and a whole host of students who are working with us. It's not a thing that one can do alone. So can anyone play Witness to the Revolution? Is this a game when it's ready that will hit our Xboxes and Playstations or perhaps our computers? When it's finally ready, it will be widely accessible. We hope that a piece of it will live only in the old state house to encourage people to actually go once we can go back to buildings again and be part of where the action happened. But yes, most of the game will be freely accessible, downloadable, and easy to find. We hope to have a beta version of Playtest this summer. Serena, given that you've approached the Boston Massacre from two different angles between your book, The Boston Massacre Family History, and your video game, Witness to the Revolution, I wonder what the key takeaways are that you'd really like for us to know about the Boston Massacre and its role in the American Revolution. The Boston Massacre has become such a cartoon of an event. And that's partly because of the picture that Paul Revere has given us that's reprinted in just about every American history textbook ever printed. We forget that actually it was an event that was made up of real people who had real emotions and lives and bodies and that their actual lived experience is part of what shapes the coming of the American Revolution. And now we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone 
had acted differently. In your opinion, what might have happened if the British Army had refused to transport the wives and children of its soldiers to Boston? How would the occupation of Boston and the Boston Massacre have been different if wives and children had been barred from accompanying the army? I think that if there had been no women and children with the British Army, we could imagine that it would look a lot more like, say, a 20th century army that travels just with its fighting force. And at that point, I think we might imagine that the relationship of the troops to the people of Boston would have looked really different if soldiers, for example, imagined or understood that the women that they met were not going to be part of their lives, right? We're not going to travel around with them. The idea of marrying them makes much less sense. I think that we might end up with a story that looks a lot more like, say, the American army in Korea or in Vietnam, right? Where you have troops that come in, they live in an area, they get to know people, but very rarely do the families that they make, whether those families are legal or not, actually end up traveling around with them and staying with them. You mentioned earlier that you're still working on Witness to the Revolution. Do you have any other projects in the works? I'm just starting to think about a new project that will move us a little bit beyond Remember the Ladies as we start to think about the Declaration of Independence and all that it meant at the time and has come to mean. One thing that we have not paid very much attention to actually is its meaning for 18th century ideas about women and gender beyond that one line of Abigail Adams. And I think maybe it's time to open that up a little bit. And how can we reach you if we have more questions about the Boston Massacre or building a historical video game? I have a website, serenazabin.com, where you can find stills from the video game. You can find more about the book and a way of contacting me. Fantastic. Serena Zabin, thank you so much for joining us again and for helping us see the Boston Massacre in two unique ways. Thank you so much, Liz. I really enjoyed it. If we want to understand the Boston Massacre, then we need to understand and remember that this was a real event involving real people who had real emotions, lives, and bodies, which is actually true of all historical people and events. The people we talk about on this podcast were once living beings, just like us. And if we think about what it must have been like to live in close quarters with soldiers and strangers for more than 17 months, I think we can really start to imagine the tensions and stresses that face the people and soldiers of Boston. We can also imagine how on a dark evening near the end of winter, people may have been out and about trying to reconnect with friends and family and just blow off some steam after being cooped up for warmth all those winter months, especially the teenagers, right? So it's not hard to imagine how the inappropriate but playful taunting of a soldier who was part of the force that was occupying Boston and taking up so much needed space in town. It's not hard to imagine how the taunting turned into a bloody shooting. Now, as Serena mentioned, everyone in Boston had expected that there would be a shooting, and the odds of a shooting increased the longer the four British regiments occupied the town. So was the Boston Massacre inevitable? No. But it seems that many who lived in Boston during 1770 may have thought it was inevitable, and a natural outlet for the stresses that had been accumulating between civilian soldiers and their government. It's now been more than 250 years since March 5, 1770, and we still don't have enough information to know exactly what happened that night and how the taunting turned into a shooting, which is why Serena encourages us to think about the Boston Massacre in new ways. New ways that can be seen through different lenses, like the lens of family, so that we might better understand the people and context of the event. or through the lens of a video game, which can provide us with a virtual reconstruction of the 1770 setting of the massacre. Using new lenses to view famous and well-researched people and events can help us see new details. Details that can help us better understand the people's, places, and actions of the past. 
For more information about Serena, her book, The Boston Massacre Family History, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 296. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the Boston Massacre, the context that produced it, and more about its first victim, Crispus Attucks, don't forget to check out the show notes. As a couple of years ago, we produced a three-episode series about the Boston Massacre. All the links and episode details are in the show notes, which again, you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 296. Now, if trying to remember to visit benfranklinsworld.com slash 296 is hard, sign up for the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter so that all the show notes for future episodes reach your inbox. You can sign up for the email newsletter at benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what do you think about Serena's point in question? Do you think we'll ever know who is to blame for the Boston Massacre? Tell me what you think. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.